Next, Frank Brady examines the life of chess master turned international fugitive Bobby Fischer. Mr. Brady recounts Mr. Fischer's reclusiveness, his issues with the United States government, and his reemergence later in life as a man who championed conspiracy theories and suffered from paranoia. Frank Brady recalls the life of Bobby Fischer at Barnes and Noble booksellers in New York City. This is about 45 minutes. Uh, I would like to start off, this is not a reading uh, this evening, it's just simply uh, a talk and then we'll have a Q&A, but I'd like to start off, if I may, to read something from the book to set the mood. Um, and uh, I'll set the scene was in uh, the 1960s when Bobby Fischer was going to go to Argentina to Mar del Plata uh, to play in a big international tournament. And uh, so here we go. A week before he left for Argentina, Bobby and the author of this book had dinner at the Cedar Tavern in Greenwich Village, hangout of avant-garde artists and abstract expressionists, and one of Bobby's favorite eating places. The night we were there, Jackson Pollock and Franz Klein were having a conversation at the bar, and Andy Warhol and John Cage dined at a nearby table. Not that Bobby noticed. He just liked the pub food the restaurant served. It was a shepherd's pie kind of place, and the anonymity that came from sitting among people who preferred gawking at art celebrities rather than taking note of chess prodigies. We slid into the third booth from the bar and ordered bottles of beer, Lowenbrow for Bobby, Heineken for me. The waitress didn't question Bobby's age, even though he had just turned 17 and wasn't legally old enough to drink in New York State. 18, as you remember, some of you were old enough to remember, was the limit at that time. But he looked like he was 18. Uh, Bobby knew the selection without looking at the menu. He tackled an enormous slab of roast prime rib, which he consumed in a matter of minutes. It was this, it was if he was, if he were a heavyweight boxer enjoying his last meal before the big fight. He just received in the mail his pairings chart, he didn't like it, and so forth. During a lull in the conversation, lulls were typical while spending time with Bobby, since he didn't talk much and wasn't embarrassed by long silences, I asked, Bobby, how are you going to prepare for this tournament? I've always wanted to know how you did it. He seemed unusually chipper and became interested, interested in my interest. Here, I'll show you, he said, smiling. He then slid out of his side of the booth and sat next to me, cramming me into the corner. Next, he retrieved from his coat his battered pocket chess set. All the little pieces lined up in their respective slots, ready to go to war. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those, but they're highly, hardly larger than an index card. As he talked, he looked from me to the pocket set, back and forth, at least at first, and spat out a scholarly treatise on his method of preparation. He said, first of all, I'll look at all the games that I can find of all the players, but I'm only going to pre really prepare for Bronstein. Spassky and all, Olofsson I'm not, interested, not wor that worried about. He then showed me the progression of his one and only game with Bronstein. A draw from Podoro's Yugoslavia two years earlier. He took me through each move that the two had made, disparaging a Bronstein choice a Bronstein choice, one moment, lording another, the next. The variety of choices Bobby worked through was dazzling and overwhelming. In the course of his rapid analysis, he discussed the ramifications of certain variations and tactics, why each would be advisable or not. It was like watching a movie with a voiceover narration, but with one great difference. He was manipulating the pieces and speaking so rapidly that it was difficult to connect the moves with his commentary. I just couldn't follow the tumble of ideas behind the real and phantom attacks, the shadow assaults. He said he couldn't play there since it would weaken his black squares. I didn't think of this. No, was he kidding? The slots on Bobby's pocket set were so worn and enlarged from thousands of games that the little half-inch pieces almost fell into the slots kinesthetically at his will. And all of the 
uh, images were worn off, I might say. Then he went on and discussed Bronstein's style. At one point he said, did you read, asked me, did you read Bronstein's book? I said, no, isn't it in Russian? And he looked annoyed and amazed that I didn't know the language. Well, learn it, he said. <laughs> it's a fantastic book. He'll play a, for a win against me, I'm sure, and I'm not playing for a draw. Resetting the pieces in seconds, again, almost without looking, he said, he's hard to prepare for because he can play any kind of game, positional or tactical, or any kind of opening. He then began to show me from memory, game after game, it looked like dozens, focusing on the openings that Bronstein had played against Bobby's favorite variations. Multiple outcomes leaped from his mind. But he didn't just confine himself to Bronstein's efforts. He also took me on a tour of games that Lewis Paulson had played in the 1800s and Aaron Nimzovich had experimented with in the 1920s as well as others that had been played just weeks before, and games that he had gleaned from a Russian newspaper. All the time, Bobby weighed possibilities, suggested alternatives, selected the best lines, discriminated, decided. It was a history lesson and a chess tutorial. But mainly, it was an amazing feat of memory. His eyes, slightly glazed, were now fixed on the pocket set, which he gently held open in his left hand, talking to himself, totally unaware of my presence or that he was in a restaurant. His intensity seemed even greater than when he was playing in a tournament. His fingers sped by in a blur, and his face showed the slightest of smiles, as if he was in a reverie. He whispered, barely audibly, well, if he plays that, I can block his bishop. And then, raising his voice so loud that some of the customers stared, he won't play that. I began to weep quietly, aware that in that time-suspended moment, I was in the presence of genius. Um, okay, um, what, some of the things we're going to do here is, uh, I'll talk, we'll have a Q&A, um, there is a microphone man over here from C-SPAN, uh, C-SPAN is filming this for a future broadcast, and if you have a question, don't yell it out, let the microphone man come over so it gets picked up on the TV, uh, on the camera, okay? Um, I was t attempting to do... Uh, a number of things uh, when I began to write this biography of Bobby Fischer. And let me tell you, those of you who are here who do not know how to play chess at all, or, or poor players, you can read this book without knowing, okay? Uh, this is not a chess book. It's a biography. Uh, and, uh, of course, it's of great interest, I would hope, to chess players, but uh, you don't necessarily have to know the game very well in order to enjoy it. Uh, I had written a number of other biographies, as uh, the band said, and from Orson Welles to Aristotle Onassis, and I approached Bobby's life in the same way as a biographer, sort of a microscopic look uh, at his life, uh, and uh, att I attempted to leave no fact behind. I mean, that's the way I approach all of my books. I want, I want to know every fact, every trivial fact, <laughs> okay? Uh, I may not use it, but it gives me confidence that I know my subject, and I may use it somewhere along the line. And, uh, you know, there was no library on visited. There was no archive that uh, I, uh, or no research that was unexamined on my part. Um, and in addition to approaching this as a biographer, researcher, uh, I was also an official witness to uh, and a participant in Bobby's career. Uh, I was the director of one of the first tournaments he ever played as a child at Asbury Park, New Jersey, at the old Monterey Hotel that doesn't exist anymore, right on the boardwalk there. And uh, Bobby was, uh, I don't know, 10 or 11, whatever he was, and uh, 
his mother was with him and I didn't talk to Bobby at that time but I noticed him and he was a magnet for people because he was so tiny he was the youngest person playing in the tournament and everybody gathered around and, and watched him and I I noted who knew that he was going to become what he became but I noted how serious he was uh, he really took his time he really concentrated it was really great um, we also played, Bobby and I played in some of the same tournaments together over the years. Uh, we never met in an official tournament game. By the way, we were light years away in terms of, he was in another universe in terms of uh, ability, okay? But we did play uh, perhaps hundreds of speed games over the years. Don't ask me who won. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he, uh, he was an incredible speed player, by the way, and it was very interesting to watch him play speed chess. It was like basketball, you know, neighborhood or playground basketball, you know, a lot of trash talk, you know. What? You play that against me? How dare you? You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you're a cockroach. I'm an elephant. Elephant steps on cockroach. That kind of stuff, <laughs> you know. Zap! You go, boom. Throw the piece down. Crunch! Boom! You know. And he was the, absolutely the most incredible speed player uh, in the world, actually, as it turned out. Um, so I was there. I was also the arbiter of the U.S. championship where he won all of his games without losses, without draws. It had never been done before. Uh, it's not been done since. It may never be done again. And I was right there at his board during the entire time. So I had an opportunity to study him and, and observe him, and I talk about that in the book, of course. Um, I also defended Bobby when he got into a big contretemps uh, with Ryshevsky. They played a match, and Bobby was forfeited. I stood up for him and went to, to bat for him in print. It turned out to be a lawsuit with uh, doing Ryshevsky, and... Uh, championing him, I ended up losing my job at the uh, uh, Chess Life magazine, which I had founded. So uh, we, we bounded it, uh, bonded, and, and I was in Iceland with him for, uh, actually the match took two months, but I was in Iceland for three months. I came early and I left late, and uh, during the time that he won the world's championship. So, uh, and I also looked at this book this biography uh, through the eyes of a friend. I was his friend. We've had we had falling out, fall, fallings out, falling outs, <laughs> fallings out. <laughs> Whatever we had, we uh, we had arguments, and <laughs> uh, and there were times, many 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 years where we didn't speak, and uh, so that was. Uh, but I did feel that he was a friend. We dined together. We played chess hotel, of course. He came to my house and read chess magazines. He uh, he swiped a lot of those magazines, I might say. Uh, he uh, we went to parties together. I taught him how to play billiards. Uh, we, we were friends. Um, so that was my focus: study Bobby Fischer as a biographer, as an official uh, chess arbiter as a director, as a player, and as a friend. And uh, I can tell you, and I go through this in the book, Bobby had an extremely competitive personality. No matter what he did, not only chess. I mean, he was a good swimmer, for instance, and going through high school and, and in grammar school and at camp at summer, he, he would swim. And Bobby would be, when they had races, Bobby would be in the water before everybody was in mid-dive. He was just fast, and he wanted to win. And when he got older, in the teens, and when he went up to, uh, and in his 20s, when he went up to Grossinger's in the, in the, the Catskills, uh, he would play tennis, and he be beat everybody at tennis except the tennis pro. Other than that, he wanted to win everything he did. And uh, so I go into that and, and talk about his competitive personality. He also had a phenomenal memory, incredible memory. When he was preparing 
for Spassky up in Grosinger's. Uh, there was a book of Spassky's games, hundreds and hundreds of his games, and uh, there were about 10,000 moves in, in that book. And almost as a parlor game, he would hand you the book and say, pick out a game, tell me when it was played, just when it was played, and who Spassky played against. So you'd say, all right, 1978, he played against Korchnoi. And he would then rattle off all the moves. He had memorized the 10,000 moves. I mean, that's just one, <laughs> one of his memory feats. I could tell many, many other stories, and I do in the book, actually, <laughs> about how, how good he was. Uh, and he had a total focus on chess. Many people, as he was growing, and even when he got older, said, you know, Bobby is an idiot savant, and, you know, he doesn't know anything about chess. Well, I don't know if you've read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers, where he talks about how to achieve success. It takes 10,000 hours, in a sense. You know, that's like 1,000 hours a year for, for uh, 10 years in order to become good at, at, at something. Bobby spent probably more than that, although Gladwell... Uh, disputes that, but he would spend six or eight hours a day. Now, you might say, yeah, well, so he didn't know anything else. Well, have you ever talked to a musician? No, not against anything against musicians, but they know music, don't they? <laughs> okay. I mean, I know psychiatrists. You talk to them, they know the mind. They know the interpretation of dreams. They know all kinds of things, but many of them don't know about art or literature or music or life. Even you know they know how to analyze you and tell you what to do, but uh, and I'm not putting down any. Uh, I see at least one psychologist in the audience. I'm not putting psychologists down, but uh, so yeah, he spent the greater portion of his life studying chess. So what? He became the, the champion of the world, and uh, that was sort of interesting. Uh, and uh, and so that's part of what I do in the book. I try to. Uh, uh, approach and confront some of these misconceptions about him. Uh, that, and by the way, from the time he was in his 20s when he won the world's championship until he died three years ago in Reykjavik, just almost exactly three years ago, uh, he studied constantly all kinds of books. And, and this is not a defense of Bobby, and I'm going to get to the bad parts of Bobby. I just want to let you know that he was a voracious reader, and he was, he, he could talk about uh, the, the discourses of Disraeli, the causes of the Boer War. Uh, he had become an intellectual uh, in the 40 years from the time that he had won the championship because he stopped studying chess all that much and he started studying other things. Uh, it was very interesting. So my specific approach in the book was to show very specifically how Bobby became good. If you read this book, will you become good too? Uh, I don't know about that, but <laughs> uh, possibly it'll help. It may inspire you, so that's uh, that's good. You're not going to learn the specific uh, openings because there are no openings here. There are no diagrams. There are no games here. Okay, but uh, it may inspire you to become good like he did. So I wanted to show that, and I think I have. Uh, the hours of pr practice, how he did it, how he analyzed it, and so forth. I also uh, showed uh, the difficulties he had. He came from a poor family. His mother was, I wouldn't say a vagrant, but she was, you know, when, when Bobby was born, she was homeless. And they had to live in a hospice. Then they lived in a trailer. And then they finally moved to, a, to Manhattan and then finally to Brooklyn in a small little uh, you know, walk up apartment for $56 a month. He never had any government support like the Soviets did. I mean, you know, Soviets got their country retreats, they got salaries, they could do anything they wanted, they could spend all their time playing and studying chess. Bobby didn't get that, he got zilch, absolute zilch in terms of any support. And that embittered him, by the way, uh, a lot. So I go into that. And then, of course, uh, I talk about his fall from grace, and 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 why did he re re refuse ten million dollars that he actually had from his 
uh, attorney it's for sponsorship and of products and for you know entries into tournaments and appearance fees. He just put it down and, and, and he went off into the nether of the seedy section of Los Angeles and lived there for 20 years as a recluse. He disappeared. He would not give an interview. He wouldn't do anything. Uh, the other question is, uh, why did he become anti-Semitic? He was a Jew. His mother was Jewish, completely. The father of the paternity is up for grabs. It would have been one of two men. I mean, we're not positive who that man was, but both of them were Jewish. And when Regina Fisher married it the next time, she married someone who was Jewish again. I mean, and uh, he denied that he ever received training, and yet I have found evidence that he really did have a bar mitzvah, although he never had a bris, and, uh, which is sort of unusual. <laughs> um, so uh, why did that happen? Well, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> uh, and, uh, we'll, you know, we'll get into it. I do get into it, and I offer speculation. You never know what's in someone's heart. You know, when you're writing a biography, how can you take someone's life and cram it inside, you know, the pages of a book? It's difficult to do. But uh, in any event, it's there, and I discuss it. Um, and it, and it, was, it was rotten, and he became anti-American, and, and I became ballistic, and I didn't want anything to do with him over all of this. And then I started to think, well, maybe he's like Wagner. Now, maybe if you're Jewish, you say, I'm not listening to Wagner, I'm not buying his albums. Well, I can, I'm not buying a Volkswagen, you know. <laughs> Uh, Etc. And it's possible that, you know, that's your point of view and that's okay. But I started thinking, you know, Wagner, Gauguin, you know, what about Gauguin was a terrible person. Frank Sinatra. We listen to the music of Frank Sinatra, though. Well, he was a rotten son of a bitch. So, <laughs> uh, can we indeed accept the art and divorce the man? Can we honor the art and what he accomplished and divorce the man? Uh, and if we can do that, then indeed, uh, I started to think it took me a philosophical confrontation, almost an existential confrontation with myself. Should I write this book? I had gotten many offers to write this beforehand. Should I write it or should I not? And I said, I think I can split it. I think I can honor Bobby's accomplishment while also denigrating his absolutely horrible and obscene comments about Jews and about America. So uh, this book is not a memoir of myself in any way, shape, or form. I'm practically invisible, other than the piece that I read you where I met with him in the Cedar Tavern. Um, I'm hardly in the book. Uh, it, it's, this is Bobby's story, it's Bobby's life, it's, uh, it's a great odyssey uh, of what he went through, truly a rags to riches story in many ways, and he ended up, you know, before he died as a multi-billionaire. Uh, it has Shakespearean overtones, and it's truly the stuff of uh, Greek legend. So. That's about all I have to say, and uh, let, let's have a Q and A. Remember, uh, can, wait until the uh, microphone comes around. Hi, how are you, Stuart? Good. Good. At the end of his life, where did he get his money? Well, he in 1992. He played, he violated sanctions uh, that the United States had against Serbia. He played in uh, Montenegro and ended up, uh, it was a $5 million match, and he ended up uh, winning $3.5 million, and he lived on that. But Hi. wasn't most of it, Dr. Brady? Hey, how are what, you? What, I'm great. What, what, but wasn't most of that swindled by the Serbian banker that no, put up the match? No, it was not. Absolutely not. 
No. There was a million dollars in television rights that Bobby never got. But the 3.5 million, definitely he got it in cash. His sister flew to Belgrade, stayed at the Intercontinental Hotel. It was exchanged. She then took a train to Switzerland, deposited in the Union Bank of Switzerland. So he, he, he had his money. Wasn't the U.S. government trying to take the money out yes, of the Swiss Yes, and bank? they still are. Uh, Bobby, <laughs> Bobby uh, first of all, violated those sanctions, so he should be fined at least $250,000 because he's dead now. But on top of that, he stopped paying taxes in 1977. He was so anti-American. And um, so I don't know how much, you know, he wasn't making a heck of a lot during the 20 years that he, I call the wilderness years that he was living in L.A. He, was, he had some royalties that he was making on his books, but wasn't one of a heck of a lot. But he still had to pay taxes on that. So they're trying to get a lot of this money. And who knows, they may still do it. It's up for grabs right now in the Icelandic courts. Wait, here's the microphone. I uh, wondered if he made a will, and where did his money go? He didn't make a will, and the money still exists. Now, it, he spent it over the, since 1992. He died in 2008. So, you know, he had those expenses. Uh, he bought a house for his girlfriend. Uh, he bought a, a, a condo in Reykjavik. Uh, and supposedly there was two million dollars left of the 3.5 million. Thanks. Did he believe the th Did he believe the things that he said, or was he just being provocative? And did he have friends in high school? Did he, he was in high school? Were you in high school with him? No, no. <laughs> You're much too young. Um, but there was somebody here who supposedly went to high school with Bobby. Are you still here, whoever you are? No. Any event, uh, you... I actually met him in, in, in Erasmus. I took a summer course there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. Actually, I met him in Erasmus uh, uh, in 57, I guess it was. And um, he used to walk around the campus there with his head down and a copy of Shakmati, the Russian chess journal, in his back pocket. That's as much as I know. So you went to Erasmus. Oh, I went to Brooklyn. Oh, I went, went to, to Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I went to Brooklyn Tech, but I took oh, a summer course. Right nearby. Okay, yeah, we'll yeah. forgive you. Right. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did he believe the things that he... Yeah, I believed he did. And, you know, at the end of his life... The end of his life, uh, he came out with what seemed like a terribly pretentious statement by saying, you know, I'm not just a chess genius. I'm a genius in all things. And he believed himself to be that. And so that was the whole point with Bobby, even when he was younger. Whatever he said, it was. He just, you know, I mean, he believed it. And you either accepted it or not. And sometimes he was, you know, it seemed very irrational um, and outré, but indeed that's the way it was. Yes, so he believed it. He wasn't just being an actor. Yes. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. I got the mic. Uh, hi, Frank. Hi. hi. Uh, uh, this is just a chess question. Uh, you said they, they played uh, speed chess as yeah. a game. Yeah. Did uh, Bobby uh, ever play blindfolded? Yeah, he, uh, he rarely played blindfold chess, but he did. I know that uh, on a trip from the Duval Street dock in Key West to Cuba when he played as a, a young man, they played blindfold chess, but over, I don't know what it takes, six hours. Uh, but during that time, he played some blindfold games, but his opponent kept not remembering the game. So <laughs> uh, but to Bobby, you know, in a sense, he was always playing blindfold chess because he was going over games in his mind. So, yeah. What made him anti-American? Um, there was a story that appeared, uh, a series of stories that appeared in Life magazine uh, about Bobby and um, the writer, who's now dead, Brad Dara, um, wrote these stories with a contract from Bobby that he would not write a book about him. 
And a year and a half or two years after the match was over in 72, Dara came out with a book. So Bobby sued him uh, in, in court for, I think it was, believe it or not, $100 million. And uh, Bobby, who always had problems with lawyers, decided to handle the case himself. And so the brief was scribbled, you know, on a yellow paper and that kind of thing. And eventually it was thrown out of court. And Bobby claimed that there was no justice in the American jurisprudence system. And so therefore, at that point, uh, he said, I'm not going to pay your taxes anymore. I don't believe in America. Uh, it's a corrupt government. Some questions on the front here. Uh, good evening, Mr. Frank. Uh, I just want to thank you for delivering to us the second book. I have the first one you wrote and sure. many of the things you are saying right now, like, when he was playing bronze in speed chase and I was laughing, we were saying like, I want to crush you. And he kept losing to him. <laughs> but yeah, I enjoy your book and you. I found it very interesting. And thank you for giving us the second second part of it. I, we really, uh, well, chess world needs the second part of Bobby Fischer's life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let, let's get one over here and then we'll come back to you. Uh, <coughs> yeah, were there ever any uh, clinical mental issues that were attributed to him uh, given his his uh, statements that he made um, no psychiatrist that I know ever said anything along that line and I interviewed a number of psychiatrists who knew him the latest being dr. Magnus Skulason in uh, Reykjavik uh, who was with Bobby during uh, actually the last months of his of his uh, life. And Dr. Skulitson said, and I'll give you a quote, you'll find it in the book. He said he was disturbed, he was paranoid, but he was not schizophrenic and he was not psychotic. And Dr. Skulitson is, by the way, an MD and he was the director of the largest mental institution in uh, Iceland. Very reputable man. He said he came from a troubled childhood, he was mixed up. But uh, clinically, he could not say that he was uh, paranoid schizophrenic. He had paranoid tendencies, as most of us do, <laughs> <laughs> to some extent. So, yeah. Why did the cycle end game? Well, because it's the end of his life, and I wanted to show. It's the end of his life, and it's the end of the game. Good idea. Very good Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more? Yes, we're back to this man, the uh, Brooklyn Tech trader. I'm, cu I'm curious, do you have an opinion as to how well Fisher would have done in his prime against Kasparov? Well, you know, how would Dempsey have done against Tyson? Uh, you know, those kinds of... <laughs> it, that's a kind of very difficult uh, thing to compare, things that cannot really be compared. However, um, I think Bobby Fischer uh, was the greatest chess player that ever lived. There may be others coming down the line. This uh, our, our Japanese American player Nakamura just uh, uh, won one of the strongest chess tournaments ever played just a few days ago, and he may surpass what Fischer did. But up until now, Fischer, I claim, was the strongest player. Now, Fischer was away from the game for 20 years. If Fischer had not been away from the game for 20 years and then played Kasparov, um, I would say the Fischer would win. Kasparov, of course, would deny that. <laughs> yes, back there. Hi, Professor Brady. <laughs> oh, my God, a former student. Good Lord. Hi, I'm dating uh, wait, 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 wait. Um, <laughs> Your name will come to me. Okay. Don't tell me your name. It'll I, come to I'm me. Not, but I'm We're talking about a long time ago. Yeah, well, I'm dating myself because I'm calling you Professor Brady. That's right, before <laughs> I have my doctorate. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was talking to Lillian my... Lillian O'Bork. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, I was um, on the phone with my dad the other night, and I was mentioning that I was going to attend um, your book signing. And he actually pl played with Bobby Fischer at the Manhattan Chess Club. Really? So I was asking him um, about him, and, and he said that um, at times 
Bobby would play 15 uh, people at one time. Absolutely. And he was always 10 steps ahead of everyone, so yeah. no one really won, you know, against him. Yeah. But he did mention that his mother had a lot of influence on him, and I just wanted to know if you can elaborate on that. And do you think that that really propelled him to um, say the things he said later on in life? His mother was a great influence on him in many ways. She helped his career. She was like a professional press agent almost. There was not a newspaper, magazine, or anything else in this city that she didn't go to to try to get press for Bobby. Um, she encouraged him. Did they have fights? Of course, just like we all probably have had with our parents when we were 16 years old. So, yeah. Um, they had fights, um, but uh, I, that's another misconception that I, I try to straighten out. They loved each other. They were in contact all of the years. He wanted her to come back. She went and got her doctorate uh, in hematology and her medical degree later in later years. He wanted her to come back to the United States uh, because he missed her. Uh, when he was on his deathbed, he asked for a photograph of her. Uh, they loved each other. Um, and she was a professional protester, but she was a left uh, professional protester. But sort of, a, as I say, the the uh, the pawn doesn't stray too far from the queen. Uh, uh, that, uh, he became a protester, but uh, sort of on the other side, anti-American and so forth and so on. So uh, she had a great influence on him, and she was both mother and father to him because she was a single mother. Okay, a uh, couple more questions. A couple more. We have time, sir. Two more questions. Uh, hi. Um, it, it must have been a really unique experience for you as a biographer to revisit a subject that you had written about so many years earlier. And and I can't imagine that when you were writing Profiles of a Prodigy that you must have developed some sort of familial bond with Bobby. And I'm just wondering how that's affected you over the years. You touched upon it uh, to a certain degree, but how it's affected you as you saw him change and, and degenerate over the years and what you feel ultimately was your relationship with, with Bobby. Well, uh, as Bobby changed, uh, I changed, the relationship changed. Um, when I write, uh, wrote the first book, uh, I didn't have a doctorate. I sort of learned, you know, the thing about it sounds like I'm posting it, I mean, but the thing about getting a PhD is you learn how to research, and if you don't, heaven forbid. So uh, I, I went ahead and, and learned something, and I learned something, and I wrote many other books between the first and, and this one, about nine or ten other books. So uh, I changed, and, and uh, as I told you, or as I mentioned, I, I felt very badly about his anti-American statements and his... 9-11 statements and so forth and I just I, I, I was horrified and but I had to take a couple of years to get over that and when I did I, I said I should I should tell this story there's nobody better in the world that can tell Bobby Fish's story than me and so therefore it was obli uh, an obligation on my part in a sense to tell that story and I, I think I told it accurate and honest uh, appraisal of his life. We got here, we got here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did he train physically like an athlete would before matches? Absolutely. He, uh, he swam, he played tennis, he lifted weights. Um, he was a very physical person and you know he uh, his walk, if you saw him, he was like a tennis player. He would swagger like, you know, because he was so used to, to this kind of stuff, playing basketball. Um, he was an athlete. He was a true athlete, and he kept that up pretty much all his life. During the wilderness years, there were times when he didn't do anything. But he was also a walker. He walked miles and miles and miles. He walked my legs off. He would think nothing of walking from the upper west side down to the lower east side and back again in the course of an evening. 
you know, miles and miles and miles. He loved it, and he was a fast walker. I mean, it was practically, if you were next to him, there was a wind that he would, he would make because he walked so quickly. So he was in terrific shape pretty much all, and he, and he really trained before each match. So I think that's about it, uh, unless someone has one anxious question that they want to ask. Nick, yes? Oh, I'm wondering if he had any romantic relationships, any, was he ever married or? He was never married uh, until he was in prison and then the woman that he was living with in Japan came quite honestly in a gambit to try to get him out of prison and, uh, so that he became, um, you know, so he would be looked upon maybe as a Japanese citizen because he was, but he wasn't married to a Japanese woman and they got married in prison, but you know, that toward the end of his life. He did have, uh, he was in love with a 17-year-old girl when he was 49 years old. Nothing ever consummated. However, he was in love with her. And, you know, there were occasional romantic dalliances during his life. I, I go into that in the book. Well, thank you very much. That was Frank Brady discussing the life of Bobby Fischer on Book TV. This program will re-air tomorrow, February 20th at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. We're here at the National Press Club talking to Lincoln Historian.